had a great question come in via email, and it was in um, in response to last Monday morning message. And that was, what a, where did we get the idea that we were to worship certain times? Uh, the emailer mentioned in particular Sunday evenings and Wednesdays, but I'm going to broaden that question a little bit. Who told you when to worship? Now, when I was a boy, I went to school with folk, and they had very, very firm ideas because as all eight to 10 year old boys, we knew everything because we'd been told everything or we just figured it out because we're boys. And that's the way that works. Some of my friends went to a church on Saturday, which seemed the oddest thing possible. Uh, they were Seventh-day Adventist, but there are some other groups that do that as well. And they were convinced, uh, they told that worshiping on Sunday is a sin. Well, I knew for certain the worshiping on a Saturday was a sin because our church worshiped on a Sunday. And then later, uh, not too much later, my father was learning Hebrew and he would take me to synagogue with him and we'd sit in the back and we'd read the Hebrew together. Yes, that's kind of the upbringing I had. Uh, and, and that was a Friday evening. And so that was a little bit confusing, but once again, I knew that the Jews must be wrong because we were the ones that were right. And I'm just so glad we showed up to help God in all of those things to finally get it right. And if you don't, if, if you have zero sense of humor and you don't understand sarcasm, you're, you're writing off a hastily and angrily done email now and just save your wee fingers, would you? It's all right. Uh, let's, let's just talk about it. who told you when to worship? Now, I've heard several times, and even recently, people saying, you know, it was Constantine that ordered that the church no longer worship on Saturday, but only on Sunday. And it's not true. Just who told you that? Who told them that? Who told them that? And you just keep going. Now, did Constantine make a whole bunch of orders about the church? Kind of. Kind of. But by that time, the church was already nearly 300 years old, and it had developed an awful lot of its own traditions and ways of doing things, but they weren't always aligned with each other. That's true. Uh, the early church had great diversity in some ways, but not really diversity when it came to doctrine. They were pretty solid on doctrine. And yes, I know that there are those that say we were incredibly diverse, until Constantine, but that's not really true. There was diversity, but I, I would look upon it as diversity in practice and some diversity in doctrine, but the doctrine was pretty much understood by that time. They, uh, Constantine, however, wanted it to all be solid, and therefore all doctrines like the Trinity and such needed to be settled. But he didn't sit there and write the rules. What he did was he gathered the greatest Christian leaders in the empire, and they mainly came. Some couldn't make it. Travel back then was difficult. Some people got sick and some died, but he ran, a, he ran council, uh, more than one council just to get the Christians on the same page because he wanted them to be predictable. And he wanted, for his own purposes, not because he was a holy man but for his own purposes and government and the order and peace of the empire, he needed them to all be singing from the same hymnal, shall we say. So um, that part is true, but he didn't write the rules as much. In fact, they'd sometimes disagreed with him. Uh, Constantine's son was an Arian who believed that God is God and that Jesus uh, was created by God as son, that Jesus was not co-eternal and co-equal with God as the Trinity people say. And I, I'm one of those Trinity people, but I understand the Aryan point of view. Uh, I've read an awful lot about it and I don't fight people over it. I don't fight people over a lot of things you might have noticed. You know, let's just, Jesus is Lord and we'll go from there, shall we? That said, his own son was an Aryan, and yet when the council voted for Trinitarian doctrine, he went with it. So Constantine wasn't walking around putting his, you know, big size 10 feet or whatever they were all over the process. It wasn't a conspiracy to move Saturday, you know, worship from Saturday to Sunday. In fact, the early church worshiped daily and from house to house. 
not so much in buildings, they didn't own those. Uh, they didn't own big properties, except that John Mark's family seemed to be wealthy, and there were some wealthy people that were Christians, and that they could turn over their homes and big courtyards to the faith community in their area. Uh, regardless, most people, uh, Acts chapter 2, you know, whenever the church starts with that big sermon of Peter and the apostles, uh, mainly Peter's words are what we see there, and then people say, what do we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then what happens? It's always important to say, okay, they did that, so what? What happens next? And next you see them sharing their goods freely. You see them even selling goods so that they could have money to help the other person out. They uh, absolutely were wrapped around each other's lives. And the scripture says that they broke bread, which is a phrase meaning both to eat and often used for the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper was generally a meal, not that highly reductionistic thing that we do today. You can go back to the start of our uh, Who Told You About series and find two there on the Lord's Supper. So they were taking the Lord's Supper uh, and eating the fellowship meal, is what I'm going to just call it, daily and from house to house. It was organic. There wasn't a ringing of the bells saying, now you will pray, and a ringing of the bells saying, now you will gather. It was a organic, in the street, in the home, in the marketplace, worship all the time, when you had the time. And please remember, you didn't get Sundays off. You didn't get Saturdays off. You didn't have a union. You, know, you worked when you had to work. And so worship was always a come and go event until Sunday got set aside. And that would take a couple hundred years. And Constantine did have some part to play in that, but he wasn't the only one, all right? Now, daily from house to house, how, does that, how did that evolve later? Well, again, after Constantine, the church needed to be on the same page, singing from the same hymn, or use any of those phrases you want, so that the order and peace of the empire would not be troubled. Constantine really wasn't concerned about what you believed. He just wanted peace and order, and, and that was, you know, and again, Romans had no concept of human rights. And if killing you kept order, even if you were innocent, they'd kill you in a heartbeat. And that's just the way they did things. But the gathering at buildings started changing everything. Uh, and then a day off, and then we started gathering at the buildings. However, the oldest churches, think of Coptic churches, which are almost being wiped out now, almost disappearing through war, through um, Islamic interference with, um, with the Coptic church in Egypt. Uh, and again, not all Islam. We're talking about that um, subset that will not accept Christians in the area. And sadly, the war in Iraq did not free up the land, but rather, once they were freed to vote, they voted a stricter constitution. And the Christians, which used to be a thriving community, and Saddam Hussein's main spokesman was a very open and devout Christian, they, um, the, the Christianity is almost extinct there now. And we see this sadly, but the oldest churches, all the way up through the Orthodox churches, of North Africa, which then, of course, uh, there are Orthodox churches everywhere, and the Roman Catholic Church, they still go to church every day, every morning, every afternoon, every evening. It's The masses are at certain times, mind you, but the worship is an everyday event. It's really the Protestants who moved it from an everyday event, and they didn't do that suddenly. They didn't do it on purpose. They did have Sundays by that time were the big thing. It was the tradition, it was the way things were done. Nobody really questioned that. Nobody asked who told you, um, or if they did, we don't have any record of it. Then uh, the Protestants didn't ignore God through the rest of the week. Most of them did have house meetings uh, on various days and times, but you also had family church and most Devout Protestants would find a way to do family church, even if briefly, even if only prayers, daily, as possible. And again, as possible because life was incredibly chaotic, mind-numbingly difficult, and sometimes mind-numbingly boring. And it was nasty, brutish, and short. I, um, we are so blessed, and there's no way to get our mindset back to there. 
But there was certainly no conspiracy to move worship from one day to the next. In fact, it was all the days. In America, some things shifted because of the vast distances. Uh, living in Scotland, uh, I, it always tickled me that the Scottish folk around me had no concept of distances in America and, or, or size. And if you said that you had flown, you know, that you lived in Chicago, the guy would say, oh, my uncle's in Chicago. Do you know him? They don't quite understand the size. Uh, we had a friend of ours that was going to go over and visit several churches, and he was going to go from Dallas to Nashville. And we said, great, yeah, I hope you have a great flight. And he goes, no, I'm going to rent a car. We said, buddy, you, you don't want to do that. It's a long distance. And he was going, oh, you know, go away. And when he came back to Scotland, he was, he was just, oh, my goodness. That was, um, I thought it would never end because distances, right? There's, this leads up to a point. So when Sunday worship came, there was still a come and a go at, at first. But when you got there, you didn't go very soon because it took you a while to get there. Therefore, worship all day and dinner on the grounds became a thing. And having two and three and four sermons on a Sunday became a thing because you traveled all that way. And often you didn't go there every Sunday because you, there just, you couldn't and still feed your family. You had to work the farm, you had to milk the cows, you had to do what you had to you know, fix the fences. Or um, as Proverbs would tell you, a little rest, a little folding of the hands and sudden poverty and destruction comes upon you. But what happens then when the industrial revolution comes along and people have to work on Sundays. Well, for a while, uh, Protestant churches in particular, I really don't know about the Catholic churches on this at all, but the Protestant churches for a short time preached that it was a sin to work on the Sunday, but then they had to give in because people had to eat. So what they did instead was that they had Sunday evening services, which it were a um, kind of a cloudy mirror of the morning service. It would be a different sermon and different songs, but same format. No Bible classes, no Bible school or Sunday school. But this was looked upon as those, and here's the phrase, who were providentially hindered from being here this morning would have a service. So whether you were not able to come on a Sunday morning because you had work to do when you were a shift worker, or if it was because you were sick or your horse got lame and there you couldn't make it whatever kept you from getting there that providence we still want you to be able to worship on a Sunday and so it was literally a service a kind thing to do and as all kind things uh, become it became law and some churches were saying if you don't come twice on Sunday and again on Wednesday then you're sinning uh, you're, you, you're forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the book of Hebrews would put it. And the book of Hebrews wasn't talking about anything like this, but fair enough, that's the way it was used. We need to um, realize that sometimes something we start for a good reason, when the reason goes away, that something needs to go away too. And for most people, the Sunday evening services haven't been working for 40 years, and if you don't believe me, look at the numbers of attendance, and you'll find in most churches that have Sunday evening services, less than half return for it, because they've been. And now you're wanting them, to, before their kids start school again, you're wanting them to all come out again, leave the home, no family time, because we gotta do this. Kids were dead bored, parents were dead bored, Everybody was dead bored. Then Wednesdays came. And Wednesdays, an, an excellent concept, it originally was a middle of the week time to pray in the Americas. Uh, and then it developed into a prayer and a Bible study. And then it became an obligation. And if you didn't do it, you're a bad person. Who told you that? And who told them that? And don't let them guilt you by why. Why wouldn't you want to meet when brothers and sisters are coming to pray? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't you want to go to Nigeria because they really need you right now? 
you want to play the shame game? I can do that, and I'll bet I can win, because I grew up in shame central, and I know how to do it, and it's always wrong. I had a man come to me once, and he said, Patrick, I'm really sorry, but I, I won't be coming to Sunday, because I'm away all week, and this is my only evening of the week that I get to be with my kids. And I looked at him, and I said, Greg, I'd be very disappointed if I see you Sunday night. Go home. Be with your family. Worship, by the way, is not a service that starts with a prayer and ends with a prayer. In my particular religious tribe, you, we did not believe in choirs, but some of our schools where our children went had choirs, and they sang religious songs, a cappella. But we still couldn't let them do that in, in a worship service. So you would have a prayer and you do your, your five acts of worship, whatever, and then a closing serve, a prayer. Now we've closed our worship service and now we bring, friends, there is nothing more foreign to the early church than a concept of a worship service, especially one that can be stopped by a prayer and general agreement. That's, that's absurd, completely ahistorical. And again, only built on shame and fear that we might do something that'll make God unhappy because we're worshiping him in a way that he's just not really that into. It's, it's a shame. But I also don't go all the other way, by the way, and so I, I like to offend everybody, so I'll do this and get away. Um, I, I, I hear it all the time, that everything we do is worship. No. No, I, I think worship has to be intentional. If I painted a house today, I wouldn't be worshiping. Now you might be. You might be painting the house unto the Lord or painting the house of a single mother or a widow and all of that is absolutely worship. Or you might be singing hymns as you, as you paint because you like to praise the Lord as you do. You might be, so you might be. If I was doing it, no, no, I wouldn't be worshiping. I'd be complaining. I hate painting, I hate ladders. Not a big fan of physical work. So I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend that's worship. No, worship I think needs to be intentional, not accidental. You walk through the garden today, notice some pretty flowers, and that was worship unto the Lord. No, no, not unless you intended for it to be. And if you did, if you intended for it to be, it was. So who told you when to worship? I'll tell you what the scripture says. Worship whenever, wherever you are, intentionally, and God will accept it. It's one of the reasons why our safe harbor is virtual. We have people that'll tune in on Tuesday and let us know, tune in on Thursday and let us know. We're catching up from Akron, Ohio. We're, we're watching now from Kumaka, Guyana. We're, we're watching now from New South Wales, Australia. That's brilliant, I love it. Our Australian members like to tell us that uh, they go to Sunday church, but we're their Monday church because of that time thing. That's brilliant. So who told you when to worship? There's no conspiracy here. Worship when you can where you can, with whom you, you can. And God will be quite happy with that. God bless. Hope you had a safe 4th of July, or as I, I like to call it, ungrateful colonist day. Um, and I hope you have a great week. Cheers.